We're continuing our studies of how enzymes work in Chapter 6, and in this lesson we want to look particularly at transition state stabilization. And again, we're going to examine the particular case of chymotrypsin. It was Emil Fischer who first proposed what was called the lock and key model of substrate binding. In other words, enzymes were locked into the conformation they needed to be in in order to bind substrate. So in the figure at the top here, here's our enzyme in blue, and it's in the perfect conformation in which it can bind its substrates. In this model, the enzyme is the lock, and the substrate or substrates are the key that so perfectly fits that lock. Notice this is simply a model for how enzyme binds substrates, and there certainly are many examples that follow this model. However, there's some limitations. It doesn't really explain how products are released. Also, we know that enzymes are very dynamic molecules. They're not rigid structures. They often change conformation in the course of a reaction. And it also doesn't explain how the enzyme affects the reaction rate. And so for that reason, another model was proposed by Linus Pauling in 1946. And this was the model that suggested that enzymes help to stabilize the transition state, as we've already mentioned. In other words, enzymes increase the reaction rate by binding tightly to and thereby stabilizing the transition state. Remember in our reaction diagram, the transition state was the midpoint between substrates and products. And so at that point, we're straining the substrates to form products. In this model, The enzyme is still the lock, but the key that fits so perfectly is that transition state. Let's look at the example of chymotrypsin. Here we have the catalytic triad in the active site, and here's our peptide with the peptide bond here between the nitrogen and carbon being the sisyl bond we're going to break. At this point, the enzyme has bound substrate, but no reaction has occurred. Notice the carbonyl carbon has trigonal geometry. And in this model, the substrate binding, we see that that carbonyl oxygen is not close enough to the amine group of this glycine residue to have any contact whatsoever. That peach-colored oval area here is referred to as the oxyanion hole, and we'll see why in just a moment. But just simply notice for now that the oxygen atom is not in any position to make contact with that glycine backbone. So here we are on the upper left, our bound substrate, no reaction occurred. Once we form that tetrahedral intermediate, here's our carbonyl carbon. It is now tetrahedral. It now carries that oxyanion, and look at its position now. Now it fits perfectly within that area that is called the oxyanion hole, and that's how it got its name. Notice also its position now. It's able to form hydrogen bonds with some of those peptide backbones. And that's illustrated here. So it's in a position to form a hydrogen bond with the peptide amine group in our active site serine residue and also with the amine group in the peptide bond of this glycine residue. There is a third hydrogen bond that forms uh, with the carbonyl group of glycine 193 and the amine group preceding the sisyl bond of the substrate. That's not shown in our illustration here. Suffice it to say, there are three hydrogen bonds that formed in the process of interacting with this transition state. Each of those hydrogen bonds averages about 20 kilojoules per mole, and so that represents 60 kilojoules per mole total. In other words, our high energy transition state has been reduced by 60 kilojoules per mole in order to form those hydrogen bonds. This is the primary source of stabilization, these three hydrogen bonds. Remember our best supporting actor, aspartate-102? Its goal, its role in the catalytic triad is to stabilize that histidine residue by forming a hydrogen bond. Now remember the hydrogen bond. We have a hydrogen atom between two electronegative elements. It's covalently bound to one, and of course our dashed highlighted line here represents the hydrogen bond with the other electronegative element. 
In a typical hydrogen bond, the covalent bond being stronger means that that would represent a shorter bond length and a further distance away from the other electronegative element. This hydrogen bond that forms between aspartate and histidine, however, is a special type of what is called a low barrier hydrogen bond. In other words, that hydrogen atom is equidistant between the oxygen and the nitrogen. So this means that the distance between that hydrogen atom and its hydrogen bonding partner oxygen is closer than it otherwise would be. And remember, since the bond length is shorter, the bond strength is stronger. In fact, it's three to four times the strength of a typical hydrogen bond. And therefore, by forming this low barrier hydrogen bond, we've decreased our energy hill, the energy of our transition state, even further. This is the secondary source of stabilization. So if we look at the example of chymotrypsin, we start with the uh, energy level for our uncatalyzed transition state here. And remember, we have two sources of stabilization, the primary stabilization of those three hydrogen bonds and the secondary stabilization of the low barrier hydrogen bond. So we start at a certain energy level, very unstable intermediate, and now we're going to use some of that energy to form a hydrogen bond. And by doing so, we've reduced the energy of that transition state. And now we're going to form another hydrogen bond and reduce it even further. And here's our third hydrogen bond. So we've reduced our energy level considerably simply by using some of the energy of that transition state to form those hydrogen bonds. And now we have our low barrier hydrogen bond. And so the Gibbs free energy of the catalyzed reaction transition state is much lower than it otherwise would be. And so this is a really good example of how enzymes stabilize the transition state. In our next video lesson, we want to look particularly at the substrate specificity of chymotrypsin and see how that compares with other serine proteases.